الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم مبارك نبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So uh, we'll just begin على السريع uh, really quickly with a uh, just a short review of what we covered uh, last week. Um, so الإمام المصنف he opens the book with what we said was a preface. Obviously in our translation it has it as the first chapter. Can, can anybody tell me what was the objective of the Imam uh, in this section or this chapter or the opening preface, if you will? What was his objective? Atfadallah Abu Khadija. He wants to describe, uh, you know, what is the Tawheed is on the, the, from the beginning and then start from the chapter 2, basically. So did he describe a Tawheed? Actually, uh, or what did he do for us about Tawheed? What, what is the wajibat? Ahsant. Yeah. Ahsant. So basically what the Imam wanted to do was demonstrate or clarify or provide evidence that a Tawheed is wajib. That what he's going to talk about in the book is not something recommended. What will follow in subsequent chapters is not something that's recommended. It's optional. Um, you have the, you're at liberty to abandon it if you choose to do so. No. What I'm talking about is something which is a requirement, and it's a requirement on every individual um, from an ins wal jinn, he said, basically. So that was his intention, and he mentioned the ayah from Surat uh, al dhariyat the 51st chapter, verse number 56, and that was, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn kind and mankind except to worship me. Uh, who can tell me how that shows that a tawheed is wajib, it's obligatory? How does that verse show that? Them to them. That's the whole purpose, that's the wisdom, right? That's, and if, uh, if, if Allah cre creates us for that wisdom, it means He expects that. It's not something optional, it's something He expects us to do. Good, Ahsant. Tayyib, then after that He mentioned uh, the verse from uh, Surah uh, An-Nahl. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا عِنَبُدَ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Can anybody tell me why that verse says, and we have certainly appointed in every uh, nation or every religious community, a messenger proclaiming, worship Allah alone and shun the false deities. Can anybody tell me how that shows that a tawheed is wajib, it's obligatory? أَتْفَضَلَ أَبُوْ خَدِيجَةً So if, if every single prophet is telling the same thing, you know, then it's going to automatically be uh, It must be the most essential part of the religion. If it's the most essential part of the religion, it has to be obligatory. Add to that, that these prophets, when they came, they ordered their people. They commanded them. If the prophets command something, it makes it watch it, right? All right. Then after that, he mentioned the, the, the verse from Surah uh, Al-Isra, the 17th chapter, verse number 23. And your Lord has decreed, He has prescribed that you worship none but Him and that you are dutiful to your parents. Somebody tell me how that shows uh, that a tawheed is wajib. Can we get something from the sisters? It's in the first, we're still in the first chapter, we're just reviewing it, yeah. Very first chapter, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the third ayah that he mentioned this, from Surah Al Isra. Tell me. How that shows that Tawheed is wajib. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ And your Lord has decreed or has prescribed that you worship none but Him. One of the sisters, tell me how that shows it's wajib. Hmm. Right. So prescribed, we said this word qada, which we could translate as prescribed, it has the meaning of obligated, he mandated, he required, right? So he's telling us, he's telling us very uh, candidly and specific or explicitly, this is an obligation. You have no option in it. And what obligation did he say? He said that you worship none except me. And we said there was another benefit in that verse, and that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is declaring that ibadah, worship, is exclusively his right. I have made it mandatory that you worship none except me, meaning I've made it illegal to worship anyone besides me. Worship is something exclusive, exclusively my right. 
Uh, then after that, he mentioned uh, Ayat al-Huquq al-Ashrah, the verse which contains the ten rights from Surah al-Nisa, where he begins it by saying, wa la bihi shay'a. Worship Allah alone and do not associate anyone in him, with him in worship. One of the sisters, please tell me how that shows a tawheed is wajib. That, that's what the fourth verse now. Wa'abudullaha wa la tushiku bi shay'a. It's from Surah An-Nisa, the fourth chapter. Verse number 36. Worship Allah and do not worship along with Him anything else. How does that show that a tawheed is wajib? Hmm. One of the sisters, please. He commanded. It's a command. What's a command? If anytime we have a command in the Quran and the Hadith, it indicates that that thing is wajib unless we have proof to the contrary. So if Allah says, worship me and do not associate partners with me, he's saying that what? In a roundabout way, practice or observe a tawheed and I'm making what? Required upon you to do that, right? Because what is a tawheed? It is to exclude Allah or make Allah exclusive in all things which are specific to him or exclusive to him. And that's what he's basically telling us now. Worship me and don't worship anything else with me. Ex make, me make worship exclusively mine. Single me out in worship. Okay? And he's commanding it, which makes it obligatory. Then after that, he says uh, in Surah uh, Al An'am, the sixth chapter, he says, um, <clears throat> that's the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, uh, let me think, let me think, let me think. Qul ta'alu atlu ma harram rabbukum alaykum alla tushiku bihi shay'a. Come, let me recite unto you what your Lord has prohibited for you, that you worship none besides Him. Somebody from the brothers tell me how that shows a tawheed is wajib. We'll make that the last one. I just want to make sure we have to understand what the Imam, what's his whole point of the, the chapter, and then how does the, what he cited, how does it prove his point? So, uh, go ahead, uh, Hussam. So the verse is, come, I will recite unto you what your Lord has prohibited for you. Allah tushiku bihi shay'a. That you do not associate partners with him in worship. How does that show? Because ah. it's just something. The opposite of that would be shirk. Good. So Allah is prohibiting a shirk. That means the opposite is what? Required. If, you, if, 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 if I tell you, I say, don't sit down. What am I requiring you to do? Stand. To stand up. You guys see that? So if Allah says, I'm prohibiting you from a shirk, it means I'm ordering you. I'm requiring you to practice a tawheed. Tayyib. Okay, let's now look at chapter number two, which is the chapter, Babu Ma Ja'a. I'm sorry, Babu Fadl Tawheed wa Ma Yukafir Min al So the superiority of a tawheed and what it expiates of sins. Now this chapter is an example of the excellence of the author's compiling of his book and ordering of the chapters. And that is because he starts out with a section or with a preface where he explains or clarifies or cites proofs that indicate that a tawheed is wajib. We have to do it. Right? Then he follows it with a chapter indicating its virtue. And what we stand to gain if we observe this wajib, observe this obligation. Because if somebody tells you you have to do something, they make something obligatory, it's quite possible and likely that you will do it because you have to, not because you want to. But if they tell you, look, you stand to gain this, and you stand to gain this, and you stand to gain this, this is what's in it for you if you do it, you're more likely to do it happily. You're more likely to do it willingly. And so it's like the Imam says, look, it's obligatory. You have to know this. But don't just do it because you have to do it, do it because you want to do it. And here are some of the reasons why you should want to do it. You guys see that? So that's why he follows the chapter, which we, could, which, which we said could be entitled, Babu Wujub Tawheed al ayan the chapter indicating the ob obligation or the mandate to practice a tawheed upon individuals. He follows that with a chapter, Babu Fadl Tawheed wa Ma Yukafir Min al the chapter 
of indicating the superiority of a tawhid and what it expiates of sins. To do what? To incentivize. To make us excited and want to do this and do it willingly and happily. You guys see that? Taif. So in this chapter, what does he do? He cites five proof texts. One ayah, one verse from the Quran, and four ahadith. Four ahadith or prophetic traditions. And those five texts, three of them are related to fadl tawheed. Three of them are related to the virtue, the merit, the excellence of a tawheed. And the last two are dedicated to indicate or to show or to demonstrate my yukafir min what a tawheed expiates of sins. How many adillah? How many texts? Five. Five. Three of them dedicated to what? Three of them dedicated to? Fadl al-Tawheed, the virtue of a Tawheed. Two of them dedicated to what? Ma yukafir min dhunub, what it expiates of sins. How many adillah? Five. Three dedicated to what? Virtue. Two dedicated to what? Expiation. Now, what's our job? Our job is to look at the texts and extrapolate, take out of them the virtues. What virtues are there? Because we need to know this so that we'll be incentivized. If we know it, if we read it and we understand what is there for us, that will incentivize us to actively want to what? Practice a tawheed. So he starts out with the verse from Surah Al-An'am, the, the sixth chapter, verse number 82. And he says, has everybody found it? Does everybody see that? All right. He says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِذُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ الْأَمْرِ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ So what I want you to do, first of all, we're going to try to explain and understand what the words mean. And then I want you to tell me what are the virtues or what is the virtue in the verse. So he says, those who believe and mix not their faith with dhulm. What does he mean by those who believe and what does he mean by a dhulm? The way we're going to understand it correctly, what Allah intends by this verse, is by looking at the hadith, Collected by Bukhari Muslim on the thought of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. In which Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he says, He said, when this verse was revealed, he said, He said it was very heavy and hard to accept for the Muslims. And they went to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyuna? لا يظلم نفسه. They went to the Messenger and they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, which one of us doesn't wrong ourselves? Why? Because the word dhulm in Arabi, in the Arabic language, the way it's generally understood, is to what? To do wrong, to oppress, or to be, to do less than what's required. You guys see that? So they said, which one of us doesn't do wrong? Which one of us doesn't sin? Which one of us is an angel? None of us. It's as if the verse is telling us, this is how they understood it, that those who believe and are sinless. You guys see that? So they thought, well, none of us is sinless. That means none of us are going to get whatever is, is whatever follows from virtue or reward. So the Prophet said, he said, Laysa thatik. Oh, Laysa. Laysa ma'nahu ma turidun or ma taqulun. He said, it's not what you think. What you think a dhul means here is not what you think. He said, a dhul mu shirk. He said, in this verse, a dhul refers to associating partners with Allah or violating a tawheed. Alam tasma qawl al abd al salih luqman libnihi wa huwa ya'idhuhu. He said, have you not heard the statement of the righteous servant Luqman advise it when he advised his son, saying, uh, Ya buniya. لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ He said to his son, he said, O oh my son, join not others in worship with Allah. Verily, joining others in worship with Allah is a great wrong indeed. So the Prophet explained that here Allah doesn't mean they don't sin. 
specifically means here a shirk. So now we go back and we'll understand what alladina amanu, those who believe, means and what al-dhulm means, it means. Alladina amanu, a wahadullah. Those who observe a tawheed. وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِذُلْمٍ And they didn't mix their tawheed with shirk. أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنِ For them there will be safety. وَهُمْ muhtadun, And they are the ones who are guided. This is what the verse means in light of the sabab al-nuzul. طيب, this verse, I'm going to help you out. It mentions two virtues. Who can tell me what the virtues are? Sisters. Two virtues of the people who observe a tawheed. Mumtaz, they will have security. They'll be safe in this world and in the hereafter. Safe in this world from the things that all of us are afraid of and safe in the hereafter from punishment in the hellfire. And then he says, وَهُمْ مُحْتَدُونَ Guided. Guided in this world to the straight path. And guided in the hereafter to their manzila, to their station in paradise. As Allah says in the Quran, وَيُدْخِلُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيُدْخِلُهُمُ وَيُدْخِلُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَنَّةَ الْجَنَّةَ عَرَّفَ حَالَهُمْ وَيُدْخِلُهُمُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةَ عَرَّفَ حَالَهُمْ And Allah will enter them into a station in paradise that He will make known. He will make known to them. He will guide them to what? Their special place in paradise. And so these are the first two virtues that He mentions. The first one being safety and security in this world and the hereafter for the people who practice the Tawheed. And the second one is that they'll be guided in this world and the hereafter. Is that something good? Is that something we want, we should want? Absolutely. And this is how we get it. He's saying you can get it by what? By practicing a tawheed and avoiding a shirk. Then he mentions the hadith of Ubadat ibn Samit. And that's the hadith where he said, that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ شَهِدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ لَاللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِكَ لَهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبَدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَأَنَّ عِيسَى عَبَدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُ وَكَلِمَتُهَا أَلْقَاهِ إِلَى مَرْيَمْ وَرُوحٌ مِّنْ وَالْجَنَّةُ حَقْ وَالنَّارُ حَقْ أَدْخَلَهُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْ الْعَمَلِ Listen to this hadith, amazing hadith. It says, whoever testifies that there's nothing worthy of worship in truth, no God except Allah, who is without peer or partner, doesn't associate anything with Allah, a tawheed And that Muhammad is his slave and messenger. And Isa is his slave and messenger. And his word which he bestowed on Maryam and a spirit created by him. That paradise is true and hellfire is true. Allah will admit him into paradise, whatever his deeds might be, whatever his deeds might be. All right, I wanna explain something critical in the hadith, a beautiful part of the hadith, but before I do that, who can tell me what is the virtue of a tawheed? Mention this hadith, I'll give you a hint, it's one virtue. What's the virtue? Ahsant, ahsant. Adkhalahu Allahu jannah Allah will enter into paradise. So the muwahid, the one who practices the tawheed, Allah is promising him in this hadith that he'll be from the people of paradise. Then what did the Prophet say? Ala makam al-amal. No matter what his deeds might be. No matter what his deeds might be. Subhanallah. What does that mean? There are two possible meanings. One, is that Masir Muwahid Al Jannah? That the person who practices to he, the monotheist, is going to go to paradise. No matter what, he's going to go. Ultimately, his abode is going to be paradise. He will not go to hell. And if he goes to hell, as we're going to see, it won't be what? Forever. Ultimately, he's going to go where? To paradise. La Mahala. A monotheist is not going to reside in hell. That's one meaning. The other meaning is that he's going to go to paradise, but paradise is what? Levels. It's levels. And his level in paradise is going to ultimately be determined by what? By his deeds, but he will enter. But where he lands in paradise will depend on the deeds that he did. You guys see that? But he's going to go to paradise. So that's the, how many virtues so far? Three. First one? 
Say, well, paradise is fine. Then, being guided, being safety and safe and secure. Mumtaz, ahsantu. طيب ثم بعد ذلك he mentioned the hadith of Itban, in which he said that the Prophet said, فإن الله حرم على النار من قال لا إله إلا الله يبتغي بذلك وجه الله. Indeed, Allah has prohibited the fire from the one who says La ilaha illallah, the one who observes the tuhid, yabtaghi bi dhalika wajh Allah, and seeks by that the face of Allah. So now this is the third text, and there's one virtue there. So a total of how many virtues? Four. Four. Where's the virtue? Ahsant. That the fire is prohibited from him. You guys see that? The previous one said he'll enter paradise. This one says he'll be prohibited or the fire will be prohibited from him. So let's look at the virtues again before we come back because we need to explain, explain something about this hadith. First virtue we said? Security. security. Second one? Guidance. Guidance. Third one? Paradise. paradise. Fourth one? Perfection. He'll be protected from the hellfire. طيب. How can we reconcile between this hadith though? It's a beautiful hadith and we know it's true because the Prophet didn't, didn't speak, he never would speak falsehood about the deen of Allah. But well, we have the hadith and we have other hadith that indicate that some of the people of a tuhid, some of the muahideen will go to the hellfire. Like we have the hadith where the Prophet said that Allah will say on the day of judgment, أخرج من النار من قال لا إله إلا الله Take out of the fire the people of tuhid, the people who said لا إله إلا الله, the people who were muahideen, they were monotheists. Take them out of the fire, which means some of them will do what? Will enter the fire. So how do we reconcile between that and the hadith that's ban? فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَمَ النَّارِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ يَبَتَغِي بِذَلِكَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ That Allah has prohibited the fire from those who say لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ who practice to heed and they desire by that the face of Allah. The scholars of Islam said this can be reconciled in one of four ways. Either Allah has prohibited the fire from being his abode eternally, has prohibited the fire from being the place where he lives eternally, right? To house him eternally. That's one meaning. Because all of the muahideen will, if they enter, they will ultimately what? Come out. As we see from the hadith, akhrij min al-nar, take out of the fire, right? But the second way it can be reconciled is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited the fire from a an ta'kulah has prohibited the fire from what? Devouring him. Devouring him, swallowing him up and completely what? Annihilating him, prohibited that from happening. Number two, he prohibited darakatan min darakat an nar. He prohibited a uh, station from the stations of the fire from what? From housing him. Not all of the fire, but a part of it. He prohibited from housing the muwahid. And last but not least, they said one possible interpretation or one possible uh, reconciliation is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited him from being from, from the first who enter it, right? From the first who enter it. Tayyib. So that's how we reconcile between the two. And there's no contradiction between the two a hadith. Tayyib, there's something else significant about the hadith of Itban. And that is that he said, يَبَتَغِي بِذَلَكَ وَجْهَ Allah. He says, La ilaha illallah, he practices a tawheed and he desires from that the face of Allah. Meaning he does it for Allah's sake. And what the Prophet is teaching us in this hadith is that saying La ilaha illallah is not enough for it to benefit the person who says it. Just saying it is not enough for it to benefit. That La ilaha illallah it has certain conditions that have to be fulfilled, certain prerequisites that have to be fulfilled, certain boxes we have to check. And if we don't check those boxes, la ilaha illallah will not benefit us. There's a great uh, scholar from the early Muslims, Wahab ibn Munabbih. And he was asked, Alaysa, alaysat kalimat la ilaha illallah miftahul jannah. Is it not the case that the statement la ilaha illallah is the key to paradise? The person who says it is bound to enter paradise if he says, La ilaha illallah. So Wahab ibn Munabbi, he said, Bala. Walakin laysa miftah illa walahu asnan. He says, certainly, 
but every key has what? Every key has teeth, right? If I take the key to my house and I go to your house, it won't what? It won't fit or it won't, if it does fit, it won't open the door because every key has teeth to open the door that was made to open. So la ilaha Allah is the miftah of Jannah, but you have to have the right what? The right teeth. That's what uh, Wahab ibn Nabi is saying. He said, he said, فَإِنْ جِئْتَ بِمِفْتَاحٍ لَهُ أَسْنَانٍ فُتِحَ لَكَ وَلَاكْ وَإِلَّا لَمْ يُفْتَحْ لَكَ He said, if you come with the key with the right teeth, it will open for you. But if you come with the wrong teeth, it won't open. What is Wahab referring to? وَعَلَيْكُمْ السَّلَامُ وَرَحْمَةُ وَرَكَاتُهُ What is he referring to? Ahsan, if you don't have all the conditions of it, it won't be accepted from you. And we know this is true because there were people during the Prophet's time who said, La ilaha illallah. Not only did they say it, they prayed. They went out with the Prophet on expeditions and waged jihad. They made, uh, some of them may have made hajj, and some of them may have paid zakat, but we know at least they what? They prayed. And they gave the impression that they were fasting, right? And they associated with the Muslims and called themselves Muslims. And even they said, as we said, La ilaha illallah. And it didn't benefit them. Who are those people, by the way? The hypocrites, Ahsant. They would say La ilaha illallah and give the impression, the outward impression they were Muslims, but inside they didn't, didn't believe. And they're just saying La ilaha illallah, it didn't, didn't benefit them. To the point that Allah says, Indeed, the hypocrites are in the lowest depths of the fire. Even though they say what? La ilaha illa shows you that just saying it is not enough, but you have to fulfill words, certain, certain conditions. So what are some of these conditions? One of them is mentioned in the hadith atban. Yabataghi bidalika wajhallah. He desires from it the face of Allah, meaning he says it with ikhlas, he says it with sincerity. He doesn't say it to gain, to curry favor with other individuals, with people, like the hypocrites. They wanted to curry favor with the Prophet, they wanted to be in with the Muslims and take benefit from what from the bit from the from the Muslims being in authority, but they didn't really believe. Also, another condition the Prophet mentioned in one of his hadith was Sidqan min qalbihi. He mentioned truthfulness. That the person says it honestly, meaning that they say it with their tongue while they truly what? Believe it in their heart. Not like the people who say it with their tongue, but they really they deny it in their heart. Another one that he said, um, he said, وَهُوَ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ He says it and he knows that there's no deed to worth it. Meaning he knows what it means. He knows what it necessitates and requires. He's not just saying it and he doesn't really understand what's necessitated by me saying it. What does that require of me if I say it? He knows these things. Another one that he mentioned was, um, uh, or another one that the scholars have mentioned is المحبة. He loves the statement. He loves it, he loves the people who observe it, he loves its meaning, he loves what it necessitates and requires, etc. Another one that the, that the Prophet mentioned in one of his hadith was certainty. He can't say it and he has what? He has doubt. He has to say it with, certain, with certainty. As the Prophet said in the hadith, he said, مَن لَقِيتَ وَرَى هَذِ الْحَائِطِ يَشْحَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ مُسْتَيْقِنًا بِهَا قَلْبُهُ فَبَشِّرُ بِالْجَنَّةِ He said, whoever you meet, beyond this wall, who says La ilaha illallah, and when he says it, he is certain in his heart of its truth, then give him the glad tidings of paradise. And there are other shurut that the scholars have mentioned, uh, but al-muhim, the point I want to make is that what the Prophet is teaching us here, is it's not enough to just say La ilaha illallah, but there are certain conditions that we have to fulfill in order for it to benefit us. Otherwise, we'll be like the munafiqeen, they would say it, Layla nahar, and it didn't benefit them. He brings the hadith. Now, we said the first three texts were related to what? Fadl al-Tawheed, the virtue of Tawheed. He mentioned three texts comprising of four, four virtues. Now he goes and he turns his attention, he turns his attention to ma yukafir min al what it expiates of sins. And he mentions two what? He mentions two hadith. The first one is the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri. And in this hadith, he mentions, Qala Musa, ya Rabbi, 
that Moses, he said to Allah one day, he said, Oh Allah, teach me something that I can remember you with it, some words I can remember you with and call upon you with. فَقَالَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى يَا مُوسَى قُلْ لَا إِلَهِ لَا اللَّهِ Oh Moses, say, لَا إِلَهِ لَا اللَّهِ فَقَالَ مُوسَى يَا رَبْ كُلُّ عِبَادِكَ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا He said, all of your servants say that. I want something special, something unique to me. Give me some special words that only I can say or that I, only I know. Something different from what everybody else says. As if he wanted, as if he felt, yeah, you know, Allah, okay, I want something what? Better than that. So Allah responds to teach him there's nothing better than what? Than la ilaha illallah. He says, Ya Musa, لو أن السماوات السبع وعامرهن غيري والأراضين السبع في كفة ولا إله إلا الله في كفة لمالت بهن لمالت بهن لا إله إلا الله. He said, Oh Moses, if the entire heavens and its pillars, its props, those things that support it, were put in one pan of the balance, along with the seven earths were put also in that same balance. And la ilaha illallah was put in the other balance. La malat bihin la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah would outweigh what? The seven heavens, their pillars and the seven earths. That's how great this statement is, O Musa. You guys see that? Tayyib. Thum ba'dhalik, there's another hadith which is similar to this in meaning. Collected by Bukhari in Al Adab al Mufrad on the Torah of Abdullah ibn Amr. And that's the hadith where the Prophet mentioned that when Nuh was about to die, he gathered his sons and he said, I want to give you my final will and testament. Okay? And in that testament, I'm going to command you with two things and prohibit you from two things. So the first thing he told them, he said, Amurukum bila ilaha illallah. I command you with the statement, there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. فَإِنَّهَا لَوْ وُضِعَتْ He said, فَإِنَّهَا لَوْ وُضِعَتْ He said, uh, he said, لا هذا شوي, he said, um, فَإِنَّ السَّمَوَاتِ السَّبَعِ وَالْأَرَضِينَ السَّبَعِ لَوْ وُضِعَتْ فِي كِفَّةِ وَوُضِعَتْ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ فِي كِفَّةِ لَمَانْتْ بِهِنَّ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهِ He said that if وَلَيْكُمْ سَلَمْ So he said, if the heavens and the earth were put in one pan and the other pan was put la ilaha illallah, it would what? Outweigh la ilaha illallah. So there's another hadith, authentic hadith, that supports what uh, was mentioned in the hadith of Bisa'id. Then we also have the hadith which is known as Hadith al bitaqah collected by Ahmed and Tirmidhi on the authority again of Abdullah ibn Amr. And that's the hadith where the, pro where the Prophet mentioned that a man will come on the day of judgment and his deeds will be brought. 99 scrolls of deeds, stretched out as far as the eye can see, and all of them will be scrolls of sins, the noob, evil deeds, wicked acts. And he'll be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are these your deeds? And he'll say yes. And he'll say, have my scribes oppressed you in any way? Have they written something that you didn't do? Have they not paid attention to detail? He said, no, these are my deeds. He'll say, do you have any good deeds? And the man will say, I have nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say this is a day upon which no dhulm, no oppression or wrongdoing will be done to, no injustice will be done to anyone. You do have some good deeds or you do have a good deed and bring it forward. Now pay attention, 99 scrolls as far as the eye can see of evil deeds. And the angels will bring forth his good deeds and it will be on a bitaqah. Everything he did of good will be able to be written on one what? One three by five card if you will, right? So when the man sees that, he'll say, there's no point in weighing that, oh Allah. What is that going to do in comparison to all of these sins? So Allah will say, this is a day upon which no injustice will be done to anyone and the deeds must be weighed. And on that bitaqah is written that he said in his life, sincerely, la ilaha illallah. So la ilaha illallah will be put in what? One pan. And all of his sins will be put in the other pan and la ilaha illallah will outweigh his sins. The Imam he mentions the hadith of Anas 
in which the Prophet said, Adam, That's the hadith where he said that Allah the Exalted says, O oh son of Adam, were you to come to me with a world full of sins and meet me without making anything a partner to me, meaning you wouldn't commit a shirk, you practice a tawheed, I will come to you with a similar amount of forgiveness. When you put all of that together, What's the message? That a tawheed has the power to expiate what? All sins. Any and every sin, it can expiate it. Is that a virtue? Is that something that should make us want to practice a tawheed? Absolutely. Because who of us doesn't sin? Who of us doesn't make mistakes? The Prophet said, Kul ibn Adam, khata, all human beings make mistakes. All of them commit sins. And so we should always be actively looking for those things that we can do that expiate sins. The Prophet says, for example, as-salawat um, al-khams, the five daily prayers. wal al-jum'ah, one Friday to the next. wa Ramadan ila Ramadan. And one Ramadan to the next Ramadan. Mukaffirat lima baynahun ila shunibit al-kaba'ir. We'll expiate the sins that occur between them if we avoid the major sins. He says, for example, um, yawmi ashura. I'm sorry, He says, um, the day of Ashura, if you fast it, I expect from Allah that He will cause it to expiate what? The previous sins, the sins that preceded, the, the year of sins that preceded it. So the Prophet tells us these things to incentivize for us to do them so that we can have our sins expiated. And here He's telling us if we practice to heat, it will do what? It can expiate all of our sins. And so this was the purpose of the Imam. And we see clearly uh, the evidence that he cited and this, the proof of it for what he mentioned. That a tawheed is extremely virtuous and there's a lot we have to gain by practicing it. And also it expiates what? It expiates sins in their entirety. Then he has al-masail. He mentions uh, the important issues of the chapter and we're going to look at some of them, not all of them. Let's look at number six. He says, if you look at the hadith from Ubadah and Itban, and what follows altogether, the means of La ilaha illallah become clear to you along with the error of those who are the deceived ones. He says, Al Maghrurun. So, Al Maghrurun, what he means by Al Maghrurun, the people who are deceived, are those who believe that La ilaha illallah will benefit if you say it, regardless of if you contradict it. That all you have to do is say La ilaha illallah and it will benefit you. He says, no, that's not. The hadith of Itban clearly tells us that there are what? Conditions for it to benefit us. And if it was something that benefited everybody who said it, it would benefit who? Al-Munafiqeen. But it didn't benefit them because they contradicted it in their behavior and they didn't truly believe in it. Taib Thun Ba'adhalik number nine, he says the point of overweighing of the kalima in respect to all other creation, though many who enunciate it will not get the full weight in their balance. Now this is critical here. He says that we have to understand the weight, if you just contemplate the hadith that he quoted, look at the weight of la ilaha illallah. Look at the power of la ilaha illallah to expiate sins. And he said, ذلك, And he said, in spite of this, despite this, there will be some people who say it and still their evil deeds will outweigh what? La ilaha illallah. You guys see that? How does that happen? It happens because of the Fadl. So it's basically saying that some people feel like by saying this, I'm good now. Ahsant. So, so, they're, so they're putting more into it, but they're not backing it up, basically. Ahsant, that they might say it and contradict it to the point that it loses its what? Its value. It loses its weight. Or they don't say it sincerely. They say it, but it's a cultural thing. It's a cultural hand-me-down. It's my birthright. La ilaha illallah. It's something we've always said, right? My father's 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 father was a Muslim. You guys see that? I remember one time I had a colleague uh, when I was teaching in, 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 uh, in, in, in the University of Indiana. And he said he was uh, from a country that remained nameless. And he said, he said, I'm a Muslim, but I don't believe in it. He said, I'm a Muslim, but I don't believe in it. In his mind, it's a birthright. I'm Muslim whether I like it or not. 
right? It's just, it just, it's just part of my, it's in my blood. Even though I don't believe in it, I don't, I don't pray, I don't fast, I go to the bar and I drink wine, I associate with non-Muslims, I don't say associate with, uh, with Muslims. I couldn't tell you where the masjid is in this town, right? But I'm a Muslim, I don't believe in it. So some people, it's a cultural hand-me-down for them. And they might say, la ilaha Allah, right? They might, um, if somebody passed away, they might come to the masjid. And people get together, not saying that this is right, but people get together on the 40th night of someone's passing. And they'll read the Quran and then ask that the ajr, the reward, be given. He might come and join that. He might come, like it's a parlor tradition. He'll read Quran with them. And they may make some dua in which they say, la ilaha illallah. And he'll say it with them, right? But he doesn't believe in any of it. It's just a cultural hand-me-down. So that la ilaha illallah, it won't outweigh his sins. It won't benefit him. And so this is the way, the, in this way, the Imam is encouraging us to be the people who we make sure that our la ilaha illallah will do what? Outweigh our sins, which are there. Regardless, as much as, as much as we try to be good, we're human and we make mistakes and we do the wrong things. And we want that la ilaha illallah to be so heavy that it outweighs those sins. The way we do that is by fulfilling its conditions, taking it seriously, not saying it just as a cultural habit, and so on. But from by that, um, number 12, he says, confirmation of the attributes of Allah contrary to the claims of al asha'ira. So this is important because in those ahadith, there are lots of, and we talked about this, we talked about the different categories of tawheed. There's going to be more conversation about this as we get through the book. But um, one of the categories of tawheed we said was tawheed al-asma wa sifat. The tawheed, the monotheism of, Allah, of Allah's names and attributes. That we, the believers of tawheed, we accept Allah's attributes with which he is described in the Quran and the Sunnah. And if you look at some of these hadith, you see things, for example, like wajhullah, the face of Allah. Yabataghi bi dhalika wajhullah. He seeks by that the face of Allah. So we believe in that. That's an attribute mentioned in the hadith, authentic hadith. We believe in it. Allah has what? A face. And his face isn't like what? Our face. It's a face which befits his majesty, but we don't deny that he has a face. Just because the words are the same doesn't mean the reality. Is the, is the same as Allah says, Laysa kimli shayun wa huwa asamil wasir. There's nothing like unto him, but he hears and sees. Do you hear and see? Certainly you do. And Allah hears and sees. But is, is our hearing like his hearing? No. Is our sight like his sight? No. The only resemblance is in what? In name. That's it. Tayyip, he also mentions, for example, that in the hadith of Moses, Allah says what? Allah said, He spoke. Right? Which means what? And he yatajaddat hadithullah. That Allah what speaks when the circumstances require it or when necessary. That it's not that Allah spoke and now he doesn't speak or his hadith is hadith what they call nafsi. He doesn't really speak the way we speak, a, sp a speech which is heard, but rather he speaks in a way which is what? Which, is, which basically is unspoken. Unspoken. Maybe he inspires them, they, they understand what he intends, but there's no soat, there's no sound. We know there was a sound because he said, Ya Musa, and Musa what? Responded. You guys see that? Musa responded, which means what Musa? Heard him, Mumtaz. Also in the hadith of Anas, he said, um, uh, he said, if you, if you come to me with this, I will what? I will come to you with that. It means Allah what? One of his qualities is he what? He comes. You guys see that? So this is, these are indications uh, of the sifat of Allah, which we believe in. He said, contrary to the claims of al-Asha'ira. Tabfum ba'dhalik number uh, 13, he says, Undoubtedly, if you understand the hadith of Anas, which is the hadith where he said, um, if you come to me and you don't associate any partners with me, the hadith of Anas. If you had, and then he said, you would understand the statement in the hadith of Itban. Indeed, Allah has forbidden for hell the person who testifies, La ilaha illallah, seeking thereby nothing but Allah's face. Meaning, that it's not enough to say, La ilaha illallah, even if you do it sincerely for the sake of Allah, if at the same time you commit what? A shirk. That that shirk will do what? It will undo your tawheed. Why? Because Allah said, I will do this provided you don't come to me with what? A shirk. Meaning if you come to me with a shirk, I won't. I won't. I won't do that. And so this is what the Imam is pointing out because you have many Muslims who say, La ilaha illallah. And then they go to shrines. 
They go to shrines and temples where there's some saint that's buried there and they will actually pray to that saint. They'll actually do what? They'll make sacrifices to that saint. They will write uh, supplications and pin it to the, the grave of that saint, etc. They'll do these acts of worship and devotion and at the same time they'll say La ilaha illallah. He's saying if you really understand the hadith of Anas and the hadith of Itban, and you put them together, you see that La ilaha illallah is not going to benefit us no matter how sincerely we say it, if at the same time we commit what? A shirk. Tayyib, last but not least from the Masail is number 14. He said, reflection and consideration of the shared characteristics of Muhammad وسلم, and Isa, both as prophets and slaves of Allah. This is significant, why? In the hadith of Itban, I'm sorry, the hadith of Ubadah, he said, مَنْ شَهِدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَا وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَأَنَّ عِيسَى عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ He said, he who testifies that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad, and without, without partners or associate, and Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah and his servant. And Isa is the Messenger of Allah and his servant. The reason why he says that is because some people from the religious community of Isa, in fact, a good number of them, the majority of them, they actually worship. They worship him. They actually worship him. Even though he is what? The Messenger of Allah and his servant, not God. And he has no share of divinity. To the point, I was watching a documentary recently where a man, he was imprisoned on death row for 30 years for a crime he didn't commit. Ultimately, he was exonerated. So when he was exonerated, he comes out of the doors of that prison. His family comes and you have to imagine how elated they must have been. How, how they were crying these tears of joy to see you know, this relative of theirs who was going to be put to death for a crime he didn't commit, walk out of those, those doors, right? Walk free. So they were crying and they were hugging him and there were cameras and you can imagine the media was there. Big deal. And the family as they're hugging and crying him, they're saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They don't thank who? Allah. They thank Jesus. They worship Jesus to the point. Also, um, there was, um, I saw the video of a funeral of, uh, of a person who died from the Christian faith. And the pastor was given the sermon. He was saying, give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Praise Jesus. You know, worship Jesus so that he can save you and so on and so forth. He was going on and on and on. Whereas Jesus is what? A prophet and a messenger, not God. Similarly, some Muslims, they do what? They worship Muhammad. They'll actually call him Muhammad and say, Madad, Madad Ya Rasulullah, right? Give me provisions. Give me sustenance. Oh, oh, messenger of Allah. The point is, is that he's saying that the prophet couldn't be more unequivocal. He couldn't speak more clearly about the status of Muhammad and Isa, that they themselves worship God, believing that He is their salvation. So how do we turn around then and worship them? But it's unfortunate, I actually intended to get two chapters, but uh, alhamdulillah, we're, we're, even if we move slow, as long as we understand the, the concepts, that's what matters. Any questions, any comments? Tafadal I have three. Okay. Number 12, it says, uh, number 12 here, confirmation of the attributes of Allah, mm -hmm. contrary to the claim of uh, Al-Ashairah. Al hey. What are those claims? Tayyip, so, Al-Ashairah, they don't believe in the sifat of Allah, the attributes of Allah, or they don't affirm the attributes of Allah except seven. Except seven attributes of Allah. So basically, anything outside of those seven that they affirm, they don't accept them. So for example, Wajhullah, the face of Allah. They will explain that or explain it away. They'll say the Wajh of Allah means the pleasure of Allah. Or if you say, for example, um, if you say, for example, Yadullah, the hands of Allah, or Aidillah, right? The hands of Allah, they'll say it means Quwwatullah, the, the, the power of Allah. So if they don't accept the sifa, the quality of Allah, if it's not from those seven that they do accept, then they will take the word 
but explain the meaning in a way which agrees with what they do accept of the seven uh, attributes of Allah. And so that's why he said confirmation of the attributes of Allah, attributes that they don't accept, which are mentioned in these hadith, like the coming and going of Allah, and also his speaking, wa tajaddud hadithuhu, that he speaks when the circumstance requires it. Okay, when there's a need to speak, Allah speaks. And his speech is not something which they say is like qadim, it happened long in the past, and it doesn't what? It doesn't happen again. And if he does speak, he speaks hadithun nafsi, a speech which there has no, it has no, no sound to it. This is what al-Sha'ir will say. So he's saying that these hadith show, okay, there are three examples indicating that their belief system and their methodology is erroneous because we see clearly the Prophet confirming or affirming these qualities which they don't, which they don't affirm. Okay. Okay. Um, so when, when we're going over like these uh, the issues or whatnot for these that we just went over, is it just a, a time thing as to why you omit some of them? Well, I, I, I kind of go through them and I say these are the ones I think um, are worthy of what? A little bit more emphasis. So if there's one that sticks out to you or anyone in the audience that they want clarity on, we can we can revisit it. Those are just the ones that kind of stuck out to me. That's how I do that, yeah. So any other questions? Ah, Abu Khadija. Those uh, issues, the, the comments written by the author himself or the, it was written by the publisher? So you're talking about the, the Masail, when he says the important benefits, yeah, yeah. those are his. Those are his. And that's why we said in the beginning, that we were talking about what, how do we know if a book is a credible um, Islamic resource? And we mentioned that it should be a book which quotes heavily from the Quran and the Sunnah and the other credible sources of Islam. And it refers back, huh? Which one? When, just now? Really, did I say that? I don't think so. Okay, let me go back again. I said it quotes heavily, heavily, like a lot, like, okay? Um, quotes heavily from the Quran, the source of Islam, the credible source from Islam. And so we talked about the ayat al Quraniya, or the hadith al Nabawiya, the verses from the Quran, the prophetic traditions, al Athar al Salafiyya, quotes from what? The early Muslims and what they said, how they understood things. And very little of the information in that work should be from the author saying something for which he has no precedent. Remember that? And so we said, now if we make that the yard, if we make that the yardstick by which we measure a good work, I said, now let's apply that to this work. And I said, very little of what's in the work is from the author. And so you see that, that it's Allah said, his messenger said, and you're gonna see after that some of the athar, some of the statements, we're gonna see that actually in the next chapter, some of the statements of the early Muslims, highly respected scholars from the first, second, and third generation. And then after that, he'll say what? Fihi masail. This chapter has what? Some beneficial points that I just want to what? point to. But even then, he's pointing back to what? The chapter. What I mentioned, the chapter, and something you should what? Look at this. Do you see this? And look at what he's highlighting. For example, in the, in the case where he talked about, he said, um, he said, um, if you look at the hadith of Ubadah, number six, and the hadith of Itban, and what follows all together, the means of la ilaha illallah become clear to you along with the air of those who are, dece are the deceived ones. He's saying, pay attention to these, these two hadith together and what they tell you about what makes la ilaha illallah truly benefit you. Is it just the words? So if I go up to a person in a subway, a crowded subway, I say, say la ilaha illallah. And he says, La ilaha illallah, just don't take my wallet. Do I go, ah, do I say, alhamdulillah, you're saved. Man, I saved this man, I saved his life. Do I run out of the subway and start yelling from the top of my lungs, I saved him, I saved his life. Do I say that? Is that la ilaha illallah going to benefit him? And he doesn't even know what he said. You guys see that? But this is what he says, al maghrurun the people who are deceived, this is what they believe. Is that from the imam? Is that out of his pocket? No, that's from the hadith helping us. All he's doing is helping us what? Understand the hadith. That's why he says, Fihi There are things that what? You can benefit from what we mentioned as it relates to what? 
a tawheed in relation to the chapter. So even then, when the imam does say something from himself, it's not really from himself, out of, his, out of his pocket. It's just him explaining the meaning so we have a better understanding of what he intended by the chapter. All right, so before we close out, uh, because it's time for prayer. Uh, did it fall off? Okay. So before we close out, because it's time for prayer, real, really quickly. The imam, he mentioned how many adillah? Five. Five. How many ayat? One. How many hadith? Four. Four. What was he trying to show us from these five adillah? He was trying to show us, as he says, what he said at the beginning of the chapter? The virtue or superiority of a tawheed and mayukifin madhrub, what it expiates of sins. He dedicated three nusus, three texts to the first part. And that contained how many virtues? Four. What were the virtues? Security in this world and the hereafter. Huh? Guidance. Guidance in this world and the hereafter. Paradise. paradise. For the one who says a Tawheed, come on, we all want paradise. And this paradise is ours if we can just be true to a Tawheed. And last but not least, it, you're, you will be prohibited from what? From the fire if you say La ilaha illallah and you say it what? With sincerity and you practice a Tawheed. Then he turned his attention to what? Mayukifin min al And basically he brought all these in the He brought two and we added two more. They're all giving us one message that a Tawheed can do what? Expiate what? All sins. All sins. If we do what? If we say it sincerely. But if we don't say it sincerely, we don't live up to the, the conditions of it, what can happen? It cannot what? It can actually not benefit us at all, benefit us at all, or not benefit, benefit us to the extent that it's supposed to. This is what we should take from this chapter. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.